We've gone over the syntax of sentential logic, and we understand now the grammar and the rules that are required to make well-formed formulas and well-formed sentences. But what we're missing, and what we're going to do in this video, is to add the semantics to our system. So the semantics typically means adding meaning to the uninterpreted symbols. But in this case, the meaning that we're going to adopt is just about when a sentence is true and when is a sentence false. Remember, this is sort of the question that we started our unit two with, which is how do I take a complicated sentence like this and figure out what conditions would make the sentence true and what conditions would make the sentence false? So in order to do that, we need to know a little bit more about how truth works in sentential logic. Sentential logic has a really nice feature in that it is truth functional. What this means is that the truth value of the overall statement, some large molecular statement, is essentially boils down to the truth values of the atomics. And then what happens is that the logical connectives alter the truth values of the atomics into the truth value of the overall statement. A really nice feature of this is that we can use truth tables to essentially deduce and figure out the entire truth conditions of any statement. But in order to do this first, we need to know the truth tables for our logical connectives. Now, the way the logical connectives function is essentially the way we expect them to function. A lot of people have, may have learned logic in, say, mathematics or computer science, and there they just learned logic as an axiomatic system. You just learn that certain things have certain functional outputs. But in this class, in philosophy, we talk about how natural language understanding really fuels the way that we do our logical system. So the sort of next truth tables I'm going to show you, nothing really should be earth-shattering or new. We should all know already that negation flips the truth value. So if you take a look at this truth table, it says if you start with an atomic statement P, like I like cats, and if that's true and then you negate it, then the sentence is false. And vice versa, if you start with something false and then you negate it, then that statement ends up being true. So there's nothing strange about this. This is just a first sort of formal representation of what the negation symbol does. And keep in mind, up until this point, we had no idea what negation did. Well, that's not really true. Obviously, we know from regular life. But what I mean is we didn't have any sort of formal rule about what that tilde symbol is. The only thing we knew up till now is that the syntax says that this tilde is a unary connective and we're not supposed to have brackets around it. But now we add the semantics so we know what it means. The rest of the connectives are also very straightforward. Here's the truth table for conjunction. Conjunction is the fancy word for and. And so if you take a look at this truth table, you will see that there's only one condition where an and statement is true. So P and Q is true when both conjuncts are true and false otherwise. So a conjunct is one side or the other, so we can talk about the left conjunct or the right conjunct. And of course, this makes sense. If I want fries and salad, the only way that that ends up being true, if I got what I want, is if I end up getting both. The or is called the disjunction. So as we move forward, I'll, I'll probably just use the word disjunction the bulk of the time. And or, remember, is inclusive. So this is the truth table for an inclusive or. So for the disjunction, this means that it's false in only one case. If you want fries or salad, well, you're happy if you get fries. You're happy if you get salad. You're happy if you get both. In fact, the only way you're unhappy is if you get neither and you get something like soup or something. That's reflected in this truth table. So we can see that P or Q is false when both disjuncts, both sides, are false and true in every other case. The conditional is actually our trickiest connective, and we'll see why in a moment. The conditional is the word for an if-then relationship. Now, it is a binary connective in that there are two parts, but it's a special binary connective because there's an antecedent and a consequent in that there's something at the front and something at the back. And the order for the conditional really matters. There's no difference between saying, I want fries and salad versus I want salad and fries. Those are the same. And if you did two truth tables, you could see that. But there's a big difference in the conditional when you have a binary connective and the order does matter. So if I say, if it rains, then the sidewalk is wet, that is very different than saying, if the sidewalk is wet, then it's raining. Uh, and you can see that order is, is sort of important, and that's what makes this a trickier connective. So we're gonna talk about the antecedent and consequent a lot in this course. Always remember the antecedent implies the consequent. So what's the truth table for a conditional? Well, the first two rows of a truth table are actually pretty straightforward. When P and Q are both true, a conditional is true. If I say, if it rains and the sidewalk is wet, and 
whenever it rains, it indeed happens that the sidewalk is wet, then that conditional statement is true. Now the second one should also be obvious. If I say that if it rains and the sidewalk is wet, and it turns out that it's raining and the sidewalk is not wet, as in the consequent is false, then that conditional relation is not true. It must be false as well. So the first two rows are pretty good. The odd part of the conditional occurs when you consider what happens when the antecedent is false. So the antecedent is false means that in my rain sidewalk wet example, it doesn't rain and imagine it never rains. Well then is my conditional implication true? Is that statement true or is it false? Now according to this truth table, if the antecedent is false, then it doesn't matter what the consequent is, the conditional itself is still true, which means the conditional is false in only one case, and this is important, it's only false in the case where you have a true antecedent and a false consequent. In all other cases, the conditional is true. Now the question is why? Why is it that when the antecedent is false, that the conditional itself is true? Well, let's look at a quick example. So consider this sign. Warning, shoplifters will be prosecuted. What does this actually mean? Well, it's a conditional statement. It means if you shoplift, then you will be prosecuted. Of course, I'm assuming that, you know, I'm the store owner and I'll catch you. Let's not worry about those other things. So let's say I have a shop and I have this, store, this uh, sign up and it's a promise that if, I shop, if you shoplift, then you will be prosecuted. What if this sign is so effective that no one ever shoplifts? Did I essentially lie? Was my claim somehow false that I would prosecute all the shoplifters that are, are out there? And the answer is clearly no. It's not false if no one ever shoplifts. So you can see that the antecedent, the, the precondition of someone shoplifting, doesn't need to be true to make my claim true. In fact, only one thing can make it so that my claim, shoplifters will be prosecuted, is false. And that's the combination where you have true antecedent, there is a shoplifter, and false consequent. I don't prosecute them. So a conditional statement is essentially promising precisely that one case will not occur. And if that case never occurs, it doesn't matter what else happens. Your promise has been kept, which is to say the conditional is true. Here's the truth table for the biconditional. The biconditional is the if and only if relationship. The biconditional is sort of special because it doesn't have a unique case. What I mean by this is that it basically says that when both sides are the same truth value, then the biconditional is true. So if P and Q are both true, then the biconditional is true. If P and Q are both false, then the biconditional is true. But if P and Q have different truth values, like true, false, false, true, then the biconditional is false. So there's two ways for the biconditional to be true and two ways for the biconditional to be false. If and only if is essentially saying they're the same. So that's why this sort of makes sense. A quick summary of this is essentially to know your minimal cases for truth tables. The truth tables of the connectives, aside from the biconditional, all have sort of unique options. So the negation is pretty straightforward, it just flips the truth value, no big deal. But and, or, and conditional all have a unique case which makes it either true or false. And you just have to pause and think about it. This is not one of those things where you need to memorize all the truth tables. You actually already know all the truth tables because you already know what and and or and if then mean. Same with biconditional, you just have to think about it and it's obviously the same with negation. So to know your minimal cases is just to realize that that's the thing that you're supposed to look for because that makes your life easier when we're doing truth tables, which we're gonna start doing uh, soon. Just a bit of terminology before we move on. So again, here's the truth table for the conditional, P arrow Q. Now I'm gonna differentiate between a truth table and the truth value assignment. So the truth value assignment is an assignment of truth values to the atomic statements of the sentence that you're looking at. Essentially what it just means is a TVA is a particular row of a truth table. And a row is uniquely defined by the combination of trues and false for the atomic letters. So here, if we look at the second row, also known as the second TVA of this table, that's when P is true and Q is false. And that combination of P true, Q false uniquely determines what else we see in the table. Now, of course, that means a truth table is a table of all the possible TVAs. It's the table with every single possible combination of the truth values of your atomics. So this immediately leads to the next question, how do I know how many possible combinations there are? Well, there's a meta theorem in logic for that. 
there are two to the n possible TVAs where n is the number of atomics you have in a statement. So that means if you have two atomics, like in this table, you have two to the n, which is four. You have four rows. If you have three atomics, you'll have eight rows. If you have four atomics, you'll have 16, 32, etc., etc. So you can immediately see that things can get unwieldy quite quickly if you have a lot of atomic letters. But I'm never going to ask you things that have you know, four, five, six atomic letters and you have to do truth tables that take up entire pages, it's sort of a waste of time. But it's important just to know in general that two to the n is the number of TVA possible combinations. We're going to do an example of a full truth table on the following statement. What is this statement? Remember, when I say what is, what I'm asking for is the main connective. So this is a very important skill. We'll talk about it as this goes on. But before we start, we can actually just generate the table itself. So to generate a table, you're going to want a column for each atomic letter. So in this case, I have a column for P as well as Q. Then you have a column for each logical connective and each atomic letter in the statement. And you can sort of separate the atomics, the PQ, from the rest of the sentence. Now, I've already pre-done four rows here. How do I know it's four rows? It's because there's only two atomics, so it's two to the n. So the first step is that you want to fill in the TVAs. And by fill in the TVAs, I mean you want to put in all the possible combinations of truth for P and Q, or all your atomics. So here, uh, we have four possibilities, and they're pretty easy to keep track of. In my next video, I'll give you some tips on how to do larger truth tables, but for now, it's pretty easy to remember that these are the four possible combinations of truth. You also really want to identify the main connective of this statement. So I have negation, bracket P arrow Q, or Q by conditional P. So what's the main connective? Well, you want to look and see what the levels are, and here, the or, the disjunction, is at the same level as the negation, but by the hierarchy of connectives, we know that the disjunction is higher than the negation, which is the lowest, so therefore the main connective must be that, con uh, that disjunction. Okay, so now we're ready to actually evaluate the table. So what we want to do is we want to carry through the truth values into the actual sentence itself. So I know what P is, I know what Q is, so I'm just going to copy them out into the rest of the statement. This will make building the, the truth value of the connectives a lot easier. Now, I want to know the column under the disjunction because the main connective is what the sentence is, so that's the truth values of the actual sentence. But in order to do that, I need to actually know the truth of all the weaker connectives because truth is truth functional, so it builds up from the small parts to the medium parts all the way to the overall sentence. That's how sentential logic works. That means that I'm not actually looking for the main connective of the left disjunct and the right disjunct. Eventually, I will find that. But for now, I just want to find the weakest connective, the connective that has the, the sort of least power on each side. And we can sort of see that it's got to be the conditional and the biconditional. The reason why is because on the left disjunct, the main connective is actually the negation, which means the weakest connective is the one that is at the lowest level, and that's the conditional determined by the brackets. Now, what we want to do there is evaluate the actual truth. And so what we can see is on the left, we have P conditional Q. So I have to fill out that conditional column. And on the right, I have Q by conditional P. And I need to fill out that by conditional column. But filling these out are straightforward because you already know the truth tables of these connectives. So conditional, remember, is false in only one case when the antecedent is true and the, and the consequent is false. And the biconditional is true exactly when both sides are the same. So with that knowledge, you should be able to quickly generate the following two columns. Now, I'm still trying to find the truth value of my disjunction, the main column. But I'm still missing a column in order to evaluate, evaluate that. So I need to know the next connective up. So the next connective up is going to be the negation. And here, I need to fill out that column. And negation is straightforward. It just flips the truth value of the column that it's modifying. But the question here is, what is the negation modifying? So you can see that the negation is not moving past the disjunction. The disjunction is at, at a higher level in the hierarchy, so it essentially blocks the reach of the negation. So the negation is modifying the P arrow Q. But be careful, which column am I going to flip in terms of truth value? Am I going to flip the P column, 
Well, that's actually not the case. You would only flip the p column if the negation was actually modifying just the p. But in this case, the negation is modifying p arrow q. So which column do I flip? The answer to that is to remember that what something is is always determined by the main connective. So if the negation is modifying p arrow q, it's just modifying the main connective of that statement. And the main connective of p arrow q is clearly just arrow. So you just need to know which columns to look at when you apply your connectives, and then that will make the filling out of the next column straightforward. So here you can see that I flipped the conditional column, truth value, then that's how I applied the negation. So once you have filled out everything else, the main connective is always last. And just like we did a moment ago, I have to ask, how do I evaluate the disjunction? Which two things represent the left disjunct and the right disjunct? And the answer is always, it's the main connective of those things. So the main connective of the left disjunct is the negation, and the main connective of the right disjunct is the biconditional. So those are the two columns that I want to stare at. To finish the truth table, I just apply the rule for the disjunction, and the rule for the disjunction is that a disjunction is false in only one case, and it's false when both sides are also false. So we look and we see that both sides are always false in just this one case, and we can even put a little marker there so that we know, and we can conclude that this statement is false under the third TVA, which is when P is false and Q is true, and this statement is true in every other case. So that's how we do a full truth table. We'll do and look at more examples of larger full truth tables, but what we really want to do is not just find the conditions for when things are true and false. We actually want to analyze these statements in a sort of a deeper way. So we need our new semantic properties so that we can say, oh, this statement is a this, this argument is a that. And we need to take some of our old semantic properties, like validity, and actually translate it into the language of truth tables. And that's what we're going to do next.